So if anything, just let me know if anything happens with the cameras or whatever. Um, just go like this at this point, okay? <laughs> Wave your hand, scream. <laughs> nah, what hair? Yo, yo, she, you know, you know, when I walk in here, she's the only one that doesn't say hi to me. That's all right. I, 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 I'm pretty sure you got your reason. You say hi to me. Nah, you are bald. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> she doesn't like it when I cut my hair. So when, when I cut my hair, she stops talking to me. I'll do the same thing because I, I told him he was better with long hair. He doesn't want to wait. Damn. Can't help yourself. Oh, okay. You just, you just don't want to be scared. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Being bored? Oh, you're giving, you're giving them nightmares. This is messed up, yo. This Just because I'm going bold. I'm pretty sure there's a Bible verse somewhere that if you give nightmares, to people you're going to hell. So you're going to hell. I'm just kidding. <laughs> nah. So we're gonna start off. <laughs> no, yo, she's spitting. She's spitting right now. That is crazy. Wow. Oh, she's a minister. <laughs> Both of y'all, I know I'm watching out. Now, nah, so we're going to start off. Um, I know you're tired right now, but I'm not. I'm doing all right. I'm waking up. <laughs> yeah, I'm waking up. I'm waking bad, up. Bad. Um, basically, I'm about to brag about this. You're my second guest. Oh, my God. I'm pretty sure you already saw the first yeah, I one. I did. I did. It was nice. I really liked Which it. Which is Anthony. Shout yeah. out to Anthony. He's in Watte right now. So wow. He's, he's enjoying his vacation Wow. Right that Yeah, he is. And... Nah, so I, I wanted to have you, and I'm happy to have you right now as my second guest. That's a privilege right now, you know. If you guys don't know who he is, he's our fire rep for our section in North Jersey for the Assemblies of God, Assembly of the Dios. And I want to talk to you about yourself and also what God has done in your life. what And what you could kind of like share with us about how you walked with God, how you started off, and yeah, how... How was that walk with God? How did you start with? Um, you know, it's interesting because uh, me, I, I don't think me being here is a coincidence. Um, God has definitely had me in a very specific season of my life where he told me he would open doors for me to tell people about who I am and what I've done and what God has done in my life, most importantly. So first and foremost, I want to thank you for inviting me. You know, really the privilege is mine of being here. Um, but who am I, man? Huh. I have, and this is so funny because I don't think in any other setting I would actually be able to sit down and tell people who I am because I have a really long testimony of just crazy things, of things that God has done in my life that, you know, I guess there's a time for people to know, you know, who I, who I am. Um, so my name, for those of you that don't know, um, is Walberto Calderon. Uh, most people know me as Wally. It's been my nickname ever since I was in, in fifth grade. Um, but I am 25 years old. Um, I come from El Salvador and I have been, I have been a Christian, uh, for, for what I can remember, I've been in the church since I was eight you know so being 25 now it's, it's it's been a long time i'm getting almost almost to 20 years in a couple of years um, of being in the church but i didn't always have a relationship with god um but growing up you know i grew up uh with my parents being divorced at the age of seven my parents got divorced um while i was still living in el salvador and that became that became a reason as to how i even ended up in the usa you know, um, but we all like to think that, you know, because God is almighty and, and he knows the plans that he has for us that are always plans to prosper us, good plans. Even before I was a Christian, he was already working to make sure that I would be here today. Um, so being seven, my parents got a divorce. Um, it hit my mom so hard that she ended up getting a seizure. Um, and because of the seizure, we already had family here and everything. And so my aunt was like, hey, man, like, 
you should come and visit. And, you know, between God's plans and everything else that was happening, we ended up staying here. Um, so I grew up with divorced parents. Um, just about the time that I got here, I also had just gotten diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, asthma, and bronchitis. So the doctors told my mom, look, either your son is going to die or your son is going to die. Um, and being eight years old, obviously, that's like news that to anyone would have been catastrophic. Um, so we ended up coming here. We also came here looking for better doctors, better equipment, just to make sure that I would have a chance at living. So it, it was a lot more. There was a lot more things into play than to us just coming here just because we wanted to. Um, and the diagnosis that they gave my mom right before we came here was that if I didn't get better treatment right away, I was probably not going to make it to C12. And if I did, they told her that I wouldn't grow up normal. They told her that I probably wouldn't hit puberty. They told her that there were so many things wrong with me that me being alive alone was a miracle. Um, so I came here, I got treatment from some of the best specialists. Um, and, you know, it was some very hard years. I spent, I used to, you know, come into my house and obviously, you know, not many people know about this. This is probably the first time that I'm ever speaking about it. But I remember the countless nights that I would have to go into my respiratory machine and I would have to breathe into it because of my asthma, because of my bronchitis, because of my cystic fibrosis. And all of those conditions are all respiratory conditions. So on top of the doctors being like, yeah, like he's going to die, they were like, his body's fighting for life right now. That's crazy. So um, I was going through all of that. I, I could remember the countless medicines that I had to take, the routines that I had to go through. Um, for a very long time, my mom, every night, she would have to put me on her, on, her, on her legs, and she would have to pat my back. And the reason why she had to do that was because she would break up the mucus in my lungs because it was so much that it was clogging my lungs. And so she would have to slap my back, my, my back, to break up all the mucus so that I would be able to somewhat sleep. And so um, those are some very crazy years, and I suffered from, from that for, for a very good time. Um, up until my mom one day, you know, we had already been in church at that time. My mom had already given her life to Christ, and even though I wasn't necessarily a believer, my mom being a believer, her faith saved me. You know, one day she decided, she was like, we're done. I don't know what kind of crazy faith my mom had, but she was like, I believe in a God of miracles, and I'm going to see it with my son. So she grabbed all the medicine one day, random, random day out of the week, grabbed all the medicine, threw it all out. And she was like, and you will be healed. And the next time that I went for a checkup, they were like, what, what did you say that your son had? Because we are looking at all these examinations and he has nothing. So um, from a very early age in my life, I got to witness the power of God. Even if I didn't understand it, you know, later on, as the years came by, I started realizing that just alone, the reason why I was alive was because God had healed me, you know. And you would think that that would be enough to really give your life to God, right? Well, in my case, it, it wasn't. So, I, you know, God saved me. Um, and as I grew up, my mom having to work two jobs, sometimes three jobs. It was just me, my mom, and my brother. Um, my mom used to have to work two jobs. Uh, you know, I remember, I have a vivid, vivid memory of when we were living uh, in an apartment one time. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night randomly. And, and I just looked through the hallway into the kitchen. And I saw my mom falling asleep in the kitchen because she was getting ready to go to her next job. And so my mom, God bless her soul. I, I Man, God definitely knows what he does because that woman, you know, I know that mothers, the, the kind of love that mothers have is unique. But I think that the parents that God gives us very specifically, they are ordained by him. Because God knew that 
she was going to have to go through that and that she would be strong enough to go through that. Um, my brother also had to get a job around, you know, when he was 16, 17 uh, to start helping out my mom. So I would be alone most of the times and being unsupervised for the vast majority of, of my years growing up, I grew up by myself. You know, I started making friends in school. I started just becoming very acquainted. And at a very young age, I was extremely angry. I had a terrible attitude problem. I remember being probably in fifth grade-ish, um, and I got my mom in trouble because I came to school with a bat trying to beat someone up because... Sure. <laughs> a bat? Yeah, I, so, <laughs> so I used to be in ESL classes, and there would be kids that would bully me. They'd be like, ah, like, you can't speak English. How, it, how you've grown up in, like, so many different, like, things that, like, me, I've seen, but never gone through myself. How was that, like, even in ESL, how was that, like, what, what grade was that? Like, what, high school, maybe? No, that was elementary school. Elementary. Yeah, like, all of these things had, like, my life was chaos. And that was at a young age, too. That's what yeah. is hitting me right now. Like, yeah, like, a lot, and there's so many other kids that go through, like, the same thing. I, thank God, I haven't. Yeah. But... That's just, it's kind of yeah. like hitting me right it's, now. I'm not gonna lie. I was I I wasn't even 12 yet, and and I had already, you know, like I, I was doing I was getting into I was trying to beat up kids. So I definitely was getting myself in some very bad situations. Um, leading up to around that time, I ended up meeting a friend, um, in, in our in our block. Uh, like he was my next door neighbor, and his older brother had become acquainted with with a, a gang, who. In the next block over, they had started a gang, like a, a, a neighborhood gang. They weren't anything crazy, but what they were doing was not okay. <laughs> so they would go and, and they would steal. They would go into junkyards and they would go into people's trucks, cars, and they would take stereos, wallets. And I became invested in that lifestyle because he was my friend and I didn't know any better. You know, and I started getting into that and, and I started liking it. And I remember one time um, we, we went through the regular routine. You know, it all started with us playing manhunt in the street with, 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 with the friends from the block. And then it came from playing manhunt to us running away from the cops. Like things changed very drastically in my life. Um, I was definitely not with the right people. You know, like we were throwing up sets, like just really thinking that we were it like there was nobody above us keep in mind i'm still not even 12 yet while i'm involved in this like i was the youngest one in the group i was probably maybe about nine nine ish ten around that time like i was young i was young being involved in that and i remember one time it was the first time that they had ever they felt that i was good enough where i could go with them where they would go and they brought me to this junkyard I had no idea what we were doing. And we go in there and everyone, you know, they start joking around. They start grabbing the fire extinguishers out of the trucks and they're just playing with it. All of a sudden, the leader of, of the gang comes up to me. He's like, yo, I got to show you something. This is what we really do here. I'm like, all right. So I go up to him and he starts pick locking a car, opens it. We go inside and he's like, take whatever you see that's of value. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, if you see money, this stereo that's here, we're taking that. If you see money, boots, anything that you see could be sold or have money for, take it. I was like, all right. <laughs> so I went, I took the stereo out of the console, took the wallet, and, you know, that day, as we're, like, stealing all these things, everyone, like, it wasn't just us. It was, like, seven, eight other people, and everyone is going through trucks. Little did we know, um, they had gone there several times, so the people that would park their trucks there had hired someone that was a retired cop to watch over the yard because they knew that they had been getting their things stolen. And so me and him are just going through things. Keep in mind, like, we're, we're in the truck cabin, so, like, we can still see outside. So I look up for a second, and I see them playing with the extinguishers in, like, the little space in between all the cars, and they're just going crazy. And then all of a the sudden, there was a house that was along so like the yard was like this and the fence was lined up against houses and all of a sudden in the house i remember this very vividly 
I see a window light up. Keep in mind, this is about three in the morning. Three in the morning. And I see, I see a window light up, and I stay there because I'm like, what is someone doing awake at three in the morning? First of all, and then I look at them I'm like, oh wait, we're like, we're, we're kind of bugging out right now. And then so I stay looking just to see what's gonna happen. Out of curiosity, I see a man open up the window, take out his gun, and start shooting at the people that I was with. And so the first shot ran off, the second shot ran off, and so my friend got the extinguisher, opened it, and just tossed it up, just made a smoke screen of a fire extinguisher. And, my, and my, the guy that I was with goes to me, we gotta go. So we get out the truck and we're running. We're just running through trucks. And keep in mind, I'm like, I'm trying to keep up because they're all old. They were like 16, 17, 18. I'm like 10 years old, trying to keep up with them. I'm like scrambling, I'm like falling over. And then we finally get to a fence that we had to jump over. And then as I go to the fence, I jump, I try to do it in one go. And I jump over and I go, and I was wearing cargo shorts. They specifically told me to wear cargo shorts because of all the pockets that it had. Uh -huh. So, you know, I jump over, and as I jump over, the cargos got stuck on the fence, and I stayed hung, like, over the fence, and I was just hanging. They finally picked me up, they took me, and they're like, run. So we keep running. By this time, the cops are already, like, they're in the yard. We hear the cops around the blocks, like, it was, it was crazy. And so I start running out, and I'm like, what do I do now? I'm like, I still have the stereo, I still have the money, I still have cash. He's like, go home and meet me tomorrow. If you don't see me tomorrow, the next time we see each other, you give me everything. So he was prepared to go to jail, is what I understood. When I look back on it, everyone there was prepared to go to jail for what they had done. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. And so I remember I take off running, I put on my hood, and eventually after running, I just started running and I did not stop. All I would hear was just sirens going this way, that way. And then I finally slowed down, I calmed down. And that's when I realized that I'm like, wait, I'm like, why do I feel water coming down my leg? And I look at my leg and my shorts had ripped and the fence had gotten into my leg. And all of a sudden I got blood dripping down my leg. So I stand on the side of the street and I'm like trying to clean my leg. I'm like, oh my God, like, cause I have to get back home. And so I clean myself up, whatever, you know, I'm fine. I start walking. And as I'm walking, I'm like, oh, you know what? Thank God, like, I'm almost home. And then behind me, I just start hearing footsteps, like running. So I'm, I'm walking and all I hear behind me is just like, and I'm like, keep in mind, like, I'm trying to keep my cool. I'm like, either I'm about to get killed I'm about to get arrested or something's gonna happen that is not good. So I just kept walking, I put my head down, I just kept walking. And all of a sudden these cops run by me and they just keep going. And I just, I remember I looked up a little bit and I just saw the gun holster, the boots and the pants. And when I saw them, I froze for like two seconds. And I was like, gotta keep going. So I kept walking and then I, I hear the, the running stops. I'm like, oh, thank God. Like, you know, they, they got away. They, I don't hear them anymore. Turns out they had just stopped and they had turned around. And they're like, hey, you with the black hoodie. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, I have a black hoodie. <laughs> I'm like, and like for a second, I go like this. And I'm like, and they're like, no, you, you're the only one on the street. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, it's me. And so um, I look up and I'm like, yeah, keep in mind, like, you're, it's not me at 25 you're talking about. It's a 10-year-old kid in the middle of the street at 3 in the morning. You know, that's it. And to be honest, if I was a guy, I would have questioned that right away, a kid. And so he comes up to me. He's like, where are you going? I was like, I'm going home. I was so good at all the bad things that I did, that I was so good at lying. I was so good at manipulating. And at 10 years old, I knew my situation. I knew where I was in. I looked at him dead in the eye and I gave him a whole story that he believed. I was like, yeah, I'm just coming from my friend's house. I'm walking home. He said, why are you doing this so late? Don't you have to be somewhere? Like, where are your parents? And I was like, no, no, you know, like, this is just what we usually do. You know, I just, I, it's never this late. I'm just walking home. And then he was trying to interrogate me 
He was like, you know, have you looked? We got called about this. Have you seen anyone or have you heard anything? And I'm like, officer, I'm so sorry. I don't know. I'm just trying to get home to my mom. You know, my mom is worried. I'm already in trouble. Can you please just let me go? And something about them, when I said that, I'm just trying to get home to my mom, they probably were like, oh, my God, this is a little kid. We need to let him go. Yeah. And they let me go. So I get home like 3.30 in the morning, 10 years old. I run to my room, put the blanket over. I'm like, oh, God, thank you. Like, I made it home. <laughs> like, I'm doing perfectly fine. And then I start falling asleep. And all of a sudden, I hear the door open. And my mom comes in the room. She takes the blanket off. She's like, where were you? What? I was about to question. I'm like, and yo, yeah. My mom ran my pockets. And she found those things. She don't beat my butt. <laughs> you know, like when you when you get beat so so bad, you have the best sleep of your life. Like I remember going back into that bed, and I was just like, <laughs> keep in mind, very well deserved, because my mom had no idea what I had just done. And the fact that I had gotten home alone was a miracle, right? And so that happened. I ended up moving away. They actually ended up moving away. And so that whole like click that started ended up leaving with me. And because of that, I stopped being a part of that. But I was with them for a very long time, you know, and I have learned so many things, gotten into so many things. A lot of bad things, but, you know, then you would think that that would make me get closer to God, right? <laughs> any, any kid in the right mind at 10 years old, I mean, like, you know what? I, I almost died. Like, the devil was trying to kill me physically. I almost died today physically in what I was doing. Let me, let me give my life to God. Because keep in mind, this whole time, I'm still going to church. Yeah. Like, I'm going to church every week. Throughout the week, I'm robbing. Throughout the week, like, I'm, I'm like, just not doing good things. I'm fighting. We're, like, jumping kids. Like, not good things. And that wasn't enough for me. I ended up getting expelled out of my elementary school, um, seventh grade year. In eighth grade, uh, I go into Bloomfield Middle School. And first first couple months I'm there, probably up until like December time, um, the school charged me with distribution of drugs in school grounds because they had video evidence of me distributing weed in school. That is crazy. And so in that way, I tell you that I also used to smoke weed. I used to drink alcohol and I was involved with some very bad people again, you know. So, you know, God bless my mom because I had just gotten that. I had just gotten expelled. So many things have been going on in my life as if my mom didn't have her own battles to deal with. Mm -hmm. I'm on top just not making it any easier for her. You know, um, and that was a breaking point where my mom was like, look, my brother, if you don't fix yourself, you're going to find yourself back in El Salvador somewhere. And I was like, I, I don't think I want to do that. So <laughs> I should probably want to get my act together. And I, I want to say that I wish that that was enough for me. But up until I was maybe 17, it wasn't when I really decided to change my life you know up until 17 i had already lost my virginity i had been in drugs alcohol the gang i was stealing i was fighting i was hurting people so whenever someone comes up to me and they speak to me and they're like oh my god like you don't know how bad i you know like i've made so many mistakes I'm like, no, I, I think, I, <laughs> trust me when I tell you, I think that I can, I might just know what you're talking about. Um, and, you know, throughout my life, I had a very hard time dealing with the blame of my decisions in the past that I had made, you know, and even up to then, when I was 17, it is when I felt like I really started wanting to make a change. And that's when the devil kind of like met up with me. He was like, all right, you're trying to make a change? We'll stop you. So at 18, I made some very bad decisions that also caused me 
to get discipline in the church. Now, most people, if you've been a saint your whole life, you haven't made any mistakes specifically in the church, maybe in school you're bad, but in church you've been a goody two-shoes, you have no idea what discipline is for, right? So discipline is taking action when you do something that would be very detrimental to another person's soul, right? And there was attempts of fornication that happened with someone else that shouldn't have happened. So many things that also happened between that that caused me to be put in discipline. And I was in discipline for a very long time. Um, and through that, that's when God started rebuilding me. And it's crazy because I had done all these other crazy things in life, but it wasn't in that until that moment when I was 18 that I was like, God, I'm going to give my life to you. Throughout all my life, I had got, keep in mind, I got baptized in the spirit at nine years old. So I, I, the first time I spoke in tongues was nine, ten. I went to a camp retreat for older youth that I wasn't supposed to be at, but somehow I ended up there. My mom just used to send me to these retreats. So I'm like, I don't know what to do with this kid anymore. Like, he's just, God, like, he's a lot. So you got to take care of him. And, you know, we, we thank God for moms that believe in prayer, for moms Amen. that pray over the kids, for moms that really fight the good fight, that no matter what they see in their child, they continue to pray. And I am a living testimony that the prayers of a mother still work, still work today. You know, um, and so at nine years old, I get baptized in the spirit, and and it, and it at nine I started my preparation, but it wasn't until nine years later when I was eighteen that I finally decided to step into my calling. My whole life I've been told, "Oh my God, you're gonna do great things. God is gonna use you. God is gonna do all these things." And throughout my whole life, God had just been using me out of His grace. Because keep in mind, it's very crazy. While I was doing all of those things, God was still allowing me by grace to bring a message to the youth, to bring a message to his people. By grace, God still somehow decided to use me while he was preparing me. I'm not here to condone that behavior. Of course not. I'm just saying that the grace that God showed me went above my sins. Because any other person, if they found out what I was doing, they would have been like, yo, put that kid to the back burner. Never let him touch a microphone or be in an altar ever again. And in God's grace, he was like, I see you now, but I know what you're going to be in the future. If God would have stopped there and he would have told me, you're not good enough. You've messed up too many times. Wow, I feel God right now. You messed up too many times. This is where I'm going to have you. I would have never became the person I am today. I would have never been put in a position where young people can come up to me and they can, and they can ask me, be like, hey, man, I, I've done this. What can I do? Out of all the bad that I've done, God has made so much good out of it. I sit here today with all the tragedies and, and all the things that have succumbed my life, all the sin that I put myself into, God made good out of that. And now, because of that, because of my testimony, I can speak to so many people and I am so privileged because there are people, the Bible says that you cannot give what you do not have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I have a lot of sin that I dealt with that because of, I could deal with a lot of people's sin. This, to me, feels like when a doctor goes to school, he has to prepare himself to make sure that when he's operating in you, he knows where to go, what to touch, what to give you for a remedy. I'm not saying I'm a doctor. Yeah. By no means necessary at all. But spiritually, what God has given me, what I have earned through my testimony, through my trials, through my errors. Now, 
there are very few people that I can sit here and I can be like, you know what, I don't know what you're going through. And that to me is a privilege because with all the things that I was going through, it was very hard for me to find someone that could relate to me. Yeah. Because in church, we grow up believing that you are supposed to be perfect, that you're supposed to have no wrongdoings, that if you sin, you're going to hell. Which, don't get me wrong, the Bible very clearly states that if you live in sin, if you abide in sin, and if you don't confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are certainly going to hell for mm -hmm. all of eternity. The Bible says that. But the Bible also says that Jesus came to redeem us. He died for our sins so that we could be set free from them. And I am a living testimony of them because I made mistakes over and over and over again. I used to have the craziest confirmations. I used to have the craziest words of people that would tell me, I know what you just did yesterday, but God is telling me to tell you that that is not who you are. You will speak to people. God will open the door for you. And keep in mind, I got those prophecies about nine years ago, eight years ago. The other day That's I was so doing, wow. the other day I was doing the math and I sit here being 25 and I realized that the first time I got a word about what I would be doing today, I was almost around 13 years old. So it's been 12 years from the first time that I ever got a word on what I would be doing in ministry. I got it at that age and it didn't manifest in my life up until I was maybe 20 when I became a sectional leader. And, you know, Although all of those things have happened for the glory of God, you know, you mentioned that I stand here as a sectional leader. And all of that is to say that no matter how dirty anyone has gotten, God still chases after the one. No matter how many people God has that are perfect, if he has called you for purpose, he will take you and he will grab you. And even if you come back crawling, because there were so many times I came back crawling to God, putting myself in situation. I remember very clearly, I used to play the piano at church. No one knows this. This is the first time I'm going to speak about this. I used to speak the piano at church, and this is the first time. This is the reason why I stopped playing the piano for so many years. I had started playing piano at the church. I had finally gotten that privilege. I've been mm -hmm. preparing myself for so much. And during that time, I had gotten caught up with someone who my ex ended up getting with my best friend. They hooked up. And so my my best friend's girlfriend used to live very close to me in the neighborhood um, after we moved and we were in Bluefield. And we had become really good acquaintances. Um, and so when I found out that, you know, she cheated on me with my best friend, I went up to her and I was like, yo, we got to get him back. And she was like, okay, let's do it. And it's so crazy how the devil operates because during that time, God was using me to start building up in me a worship ministry and an instrument that God has spoken to me about many, many, many years ago when I was 12, 11, I saw the piano for the first time. A prophet came and spoke to me. God is going to give to you what is the desire of your heart. And it finally came to pass. I had started playing the piano at church. And I start hooking up with this girl while going to church, while being a part of the youth worship team. And I get a pregnancy scare. And she tells me, uh, look, my brother, uh, I am about three weeks late in my period. And I think I'm pregnant. I dropped. Oh, my God. So I go to my youth leader. And I'm like, so I think this is it. I think this is where I go. Everyone's going to find out who I am because I've been hiding under this mask for a very long time. But I'm here to tell you first, this is who I really am. This is me. When I come to church, after I leave, I go hook up with girls. I go smoke. I go to parties. This is who I really am. And you know what he told me? He was like, Wally, 
God has such a purpose in your life. He didn't condemn me. He wasn't like, you're useless. How dare you do this while you're in ministry? How dare you do with what God has? He didn't do that. With love, he embraced me. And he was like, we are going to build you up so that next time you don't make this mistake again. So guys, you are seeing me on your screen right now. I am in one of the rooms in my house. Um, this is random. Uh, this is the first part of the video. You guys just finished the first part. Hopefully you are loving it so far, but we are separating these two episodes into two different parts. One is going to be full video and the other one is going to be full audio. I will be posting the audio twice because of technical difficulties, but hopefully you will listen to our audio version when it's coming out. We will be letting you know off of my Instagram. Um, and just to let y'all know, it will be on YouTube, the audio version and on Spotify audio version. So don't miss out. I'm telling you right now, we talk about a lot, and, um, and I also want to say thank you guys for also watching. I hope you guys keep supporting, and I thank you for the many who are been, have been supporting lately as well. And I pray that these the, the, these talks and conversations we have on this podcast, on this channel in general, could touch your hearts, and also we could spread the word of God more, and not just to ourselves, but many others who might need it. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much and God bless you guys all.